Hey there everyone, happy, happy Sunday, or whatever day it is where you are right now. I like Sundays, you know, and you know why I like Sundays especially? Because of this, <laughs> because of the Holy Shed. This is a day when I get to be with you guys down here at the bottom of the garden, the littlest parish in Christendom. Now look, uh, I'd just like to show you this little guy. Who wouldn't love this person? I don't know if it's a boy or a girl, to be honest. But I do know it's a, a purple sandpiper with a, an incredible bill, perfectly suited for grub, really. You know, for getting into all those nooks and crannies in the rocks on the south coast where we had the honour of this little encounter. Beautiful. <coughs> there is so much beauty in the world. But um, I think what we also know is that there's a lot of ugliness too. And there's only one thing that we can light a candle for this week. It is the people affected by the diabolical shooting in Robb Elementary School in Texas. So if you've got a candle, light it with me now. Light a flame for those children and teachers whose lives were lost and for their loved ones who were left devastated, angry, confused, bereaved. So many emotions. Light a candle. Send out some love. And here's a prayer. God of suffering, whose home is broken hearts, there is no depth of pain that you have not embraced as your own. As we struggle silently yet again to comprehend innocence lost, we pray that parents, grandparents, friends and many others will find some shreds of solace to hang on to in this dark time. Amen. Okay, well, we are con continuing again today with uh, the theme of the book of Revelation. And, you know, whatever we make of the book of Revelation, whatever weird and bizarre theologies it has fed and nurtured in time, its influence on the creative imagination over centuries uh, is incredible and irrefutable. You know, references and allusions to Revelation are ubiquitous in poetry, in art, in music, in films, and in video games nowadays too. <coughs> Excuse me, from Milton and Yeats to Blake and heavy metal bands like Iron Maiden, from Michelangelo and Goya to Picasso and, and horror films like The Omen. You know, it's all over the place, all of which just underscores the power of evocative and disturbing symbol, image and myth, which is what I think essentially the book of Revelation is. That said, this is not what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, basically, I'm going to focus on just two things, <laughs> which I hope will help to shed a bit of light on the subject. Uh, I'm not out, by the way, to convert you to liking, much less enjoying Revelation. It's not my favourite book, but I do think it's important to put it into context, to demonstrate how misused it's been. And secondly, I'd like to say a little bit about the wider genre of apolo apolo <laughs> apocalyptic literature, uh, which Revelation fits into. I hope these two things will help to uncover more about why this book was written and how it impacted its original audience. But let me just repeat what I said last time, that this is not a text about things that we should expect, expect to happen one day, as many people, many people believe. That's really just a misunderstanding of the nature of the book, as well as being rather daft literalism, to be honest. Um, so you need to, we need to completely set that on one side altogether. So what is Revelation about? Elaine Pagels, uh, a wonderful writer and historian of religion, says very helpfully that we begin to understand what John wrote only when we see it as wartime literature. 
wartime literature as a text written in the midst of a period of bloody conflict between the Roman Empire and Jewish resistance toward the end of the first century. By the way, it's important to note that Revelation emerged before there was a split between Judaism and Christianity. I know that's <coughs> really hard for people to understand these days because it, you know, it's as if you know Jesus came to start a new religion called Christianity. Um, it actually was born on the day of Pentecost, and immediately people became Christians, and it became a, a separate kind of religion or faith uh, all on its own. That's not how it happened, guys. Christianity as a religion wasn't really a thing uh, until the third century. And certainly in the first century, it was essentially a Jewish sect, you know, better seen as the Jesus movement. But it was a conversation, if you like, within Judaism, not something that, uh, you know, emerged out of it. Uh, and yes, uh, it increasingly did incorporate Gentiles, but as we saw a couple of sheds ago, this was highly controversial with fierce debate about whether uh, these people who became Jesus followers must first become fully Jews. That just tells you how immersed in Judaism uh, the Jesus movement was. Um, and you know, there were always God fearing Gentiles on the fringes or associated with the Jewish faith. But um, in, in, the, in the case of Jesus' followers, this became a big issue. Should they actually become fully Jews before they could become proper followers of Jesus, who, of course, was a Jewish teacher himself? <coughs> Excuse me. So John, and we should say John, the writer of, it's best to call him John of Patmos, really. He definitely is not the writer of the gospel or the disciple in the gospels. I mean, that is just, you know, Apart from very conservative uh, people, that is universally recognised within, uh, in a New Testament scholarship. He was fully a Jewish follower of Jesus, communicating visions he claimed to have happen happened on Patmos. You can see the little island here in the midst of the Mediterranean. Uh, it's about seventy miles from Ephesus, off the coast of Asia Minor in present-day Turkey and you can see helpfully the other seven locations where the for whom this book of Revelation was written. It was written to a very specific audience at a specific time in those places and most New Testament scholarship dated at about the year 90, you know, almost the end of the first century. And the backdrop to John's writing was the Jewish uprising that resulted in the destruction of the temple uh, in, in Jerusalem and more or less the destruction of the city itself. So, I mean, it's likely that John fled this war, which ravaged his homeland. Uh, he may even have witnessed the outbreak of war in Jerusalem in the year 66, when militant Jews fired with great religious zeal, intermittently attacked groups of Roman soldiers with stockpiled weapons that they had ready for an all-out war against Roman occupation. And after four years of, of that kind of thing going on, of desperate fighting, Rome, uh, you know, decided to get heavy-handed and they sent 60,000 troops to besiege Jerusalem, to starve the inhabitants and shatter the brave resistance, all of which sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? Now, when Roman soldiers, led at first by Vespasian, the emperor, and later by his son Titus, when they finally defeated the Jews, they desecrated the temple in 70 CE, in the year 70, and razed it to the ground and left the city in ruins. And this, of course, is the famous destruction of the temple which Jesus alludes to in the Gospels. This, of course, was the second temple. The first, <coughs> the Temple of Solomon, was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians in 586 BC. Jewish religion, of course, centred on the temple. It doesn't now. After the destruction of the second temple, a whole new direction occurred within Judaism and there was the development of what we now call rabbinical 
Judaism. But um, <coughs> at that time, everything centered on the temple. So the destruction of both the first temple and the second was utterly devastating to all Jews, not least because they believed that the God of Israel was the one true God who ruled the world without equal. So how? How could this happen? I mean, that's the underlying dilemma about both uh, temples being destroyed. How could this happen when God, our God, is above all? For followers of Jesus, um, these events had an added dimension because first generation uh, Christians, shall we say, followers of Jesus, were convinced that Jesus would return any time. And that's very clear throughout uh, the New Testament. They believed he would return again soon as Messiah and lead Israel to victory and establish the kingdom of God. John, who was uh, certainly a second, maybe even a third generation Jesus follower, still held out for this, for him to return and become the king of Israel and indeed of the whole world. The problem was, you know, when they looked around, the only kingdom that had come to power was Rome. It wasn't Jesus on the throne. It was the emperor Domitian, uh, who was persecuting all Jews, including followers of Jesus, mercilessly. So this, friends, is the background to Revelation. A brutal Roman Empire destroying God's people and the temple and ruling in God's stead. Revelation is basically a subversive political text, saying things in highly codified language that John couldn't possibly say in plain language. It's war literature in which John is... Uh, inciting people to stay strong, to stay true, to resist, which was a very dangerous thing for him to do. And he did this basically through the medium of apocalyptic visions. Now, John didn't invent apocalyptic literature. It's an established part of Hebrew tradition, expressed especially in the books of Daniel, Ezekiel and Zechariah in the Hebrew Bible. <coughs> I mean, if you put yourself in their positions, look, think about the problem that they faced. You're a small nation, tiny nation actually, surrounded by big nations, surrounded by mighty empires, the greatest military might known to humanity at the time. But you believe that your God is the one true God, mightier than all the kingdoms and rulers. And yet... Here you are overrun by the enemy. Many of your people slain, many others carried into exile. <clears throat> your temple, symbol of the, the presence of the one true God, is raised to the ground. Now that's a theological problem for you right there, as well as a physical one. It's a bitter, puzzling, disturbing contradiction. Almighty God, our God, doesn't show up. We're done for. Why? In Christian theology, uh, we wrestle with similar issues, often at a personal level, but also in the wider world. You know, things like, you know, why doesn't God heal my little daughter or my husband? Why, does, why doesn't God stop people like Putin doing what he's doing? Why doesn't God intervene in unspeakable suffering in Yemen or Afghanistan or wherever? The whole area of apologetics in Christian uh, tradition <coughs> is designed for this very reason, to find theological explanations. Does it work? Well, I guess my answer would be it's, uh, it's a bit of a curate egg. You know, sometimes I think apologetics does work very powerfully. Other times it completely does my head in. The contortions that people will do uh, in order to try and fit uh, awful dilemmas into these little boxes of pre-packed explanations that, that they've come up with. Now, it's not by coincidence that the text of Revelation contains so many, and I mean so many, references to Daniel, Ezekiel and Zechariah. The Jewish literary critic Harold Bloom 
says that Revelation is basically a jigsaw puzzle in which nearly all of the pieces are torn out of uh, their true context, if you like, in these three books of the Hebrew Bible. And all these texts, Revelation uh, and the Hebrew prophets, are basically dealing with the same dilemma, which is the intolerable tension between reality and hopeful faith. Sociologists call it cognitive dissonance, a state of mind that arises in the face of a disparity between expectations and beliefs on the one hand and reality on the other, between what is and what ought to be. And I guess we all, you know, experience some of that at times, don't we? The issue isn't whether we experience those contradictions about life and faith in the world, <coughs> excuse me, it's, it's how we deal with them. And that's, for many people, where the word apocalypse comes in. The word apocalypse means uncovering. It's the opening of the curtain on the stage, if you like. It's a revealing. And the strategy of apocalyptic is to uncover a greater, bigger reality in which these little present circumstances can be understood and seen in a different light. Okay, So when the Babylonians overran Israel and destroyed the first temple, and when the Romans demolished Jerusalem and the second temple, the apocalyptic visions of the ancient prophets and John of Patmos envisage a bigger scale, you know, an, a, a world of heightened reality with spiritual warfare going on that we can't see, but it's happening between God and Satan, between good and evil. Uh, but where ultimate victory for our side is assured. So that's what apocalypse, apocalyptic uh, literature is all about. Tensions between what is and what ought to be is exactly what Revelation is about. Whether or not we like it, it's a way of resolving this cognitive dissonance at the end of the first century that was happening because of all the conflict that was going on. And within the book of Revelation, within that world that has been created, uh, all beings are lined up, are given a place in what is essentially a very dualistic structure of this or that. At the pinnacle of power, uh, it, on the one side is God, Pantocrator, ruler of all. On the other side is Satan, the dragon, who has power, a throne and great authority. Allied with God is the lamb that was slain. This is the one like a son of man who died and is alive forevermore. And allied with Satan is the beast from the sea who was also wounded mortally and yet lives. And all people on the earth are divided between these two into those who have the seal of God on their foreheads and whose names are written in the book of life and those who bear the mark of the beast and worship that. And there are also sharp uh, contrasts between, you know, the luxurious and voluptuous harlot who represents Babylon and Rome, who for John is the new Babylon, on the one hand, and the earthly city uh, uh, of abomination, and on the other hand, the pure bride of the Lamb, who symbolises Jerusalem, the heavenly city of salvation. So, welcome to the world of apocalyptic politics, you know, which is basically saying, we may not be winning now, but hang on. When the curtain pulls back and we see what's really going on, well, just wait and see. Well, this is really classic myth uh, in the true sense. The French anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, who I don't think invented genes, but he, he might have done, uh, <laughs> he's an anthropologist. He argues that the purpose of myth is to provide a logical model capable of overcoming a contradiction. Okay, that's very important. Myth is, the purpose of myth is to provide a logical model capable of overcoming a contradiction. So basically, the book of Revelation is all about events taking place in the second half of the first century. Uh, drawing on symbols, images and mythological language completely familiar to his audiences to describe in 
codified terms the conflict between Jews, including Jesus' followers, and the Roman Empire. His audiences knew exactly what he was talking about, and John's intention, as I say, was to inspire them to stay resilient, um, to mobilise them in this spiritual battle, uh, portrayed in highly dualistic terms between good and evil and God and Satan. The overall message, as I say, is clear. Don't worry. God will conquer. The enemy will be defeated. A new heaven and earth awaits. A glorious new Jerusalem descending to the earth from God. And, you know, guys, we could, we could go through all the lurid symbols and images, the bloody narrative of Revelation, but that's really not what I'm here to do today. Simply because Revelation is so dualistic, so good and evil, so right and wrong, People at any point in history who are caught up in religious or political conflict or who have a strong religion of us and them, all of these people are likely to read through their own circumstances into and through the book of Revelation to demonise the other who will very likely demonise back in return. Now, those Christians who essentially inhabit a dualistic universe with, you know, literal notions of God and the devil and a war of the righteous against the forces of darkness, who believe in actual demons floating around, as it were, um, are likely going to read into Revelation fantasy accounts of the end times, just like the writers of the Left Behind books have done and lots of others beside them. So here's the question. Is this all basically escapism? Did the apocalyptic visions of Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah and John of Patmos, did they change anything? Well, you know, I guess I'm, we're not necessarily the best people to judge that. We're some way distanced from that. Um, there's a strong element of apocalypse in many African-American spirituals, which we know and love so much. And not just there, but elsewhere, if you're in a situation where you are, <coughs> excuse me, oppressed and powerless to change your situation, maybe a vision of a bigger plan, you know, an ultimate plan of justice, which will one day occur, can bring comfort and strength to live through these hard times, through a wretched present reality. Maybe it's an effective way also, you know, cocking a snook at your oppressors without them even knowing that that's what you're doing. That's really what John was doing. It's uh, what happens in some of uh, the African-American spirituals, for example. But actually, uh, you know, while I'm sure the, the black slaves in the South drew comfort from a heavenly hope, it, it, it's now very clear that their songs weren't just, they were less apocalyptic than they were subversive, actually. Slave owners thought spirituals would pacify slaves, you know, calm them down, let them have their little dreams, train them to suffer quietly. But instead, spirituals actually were their liberation theology, stoking the fires, actually, of a different sort of hope, training captives for freedom uh, with escape instructions and a promise that the liberating God of Exodus was on their side. So when you hear words like wade into the water, children, um, this wasn't just about sort of, you know, going to heaven. This was telling slaves, it was, there were instructions in these songs, telling slaves, make sure when you escape that you pass through waters where the master's bloodhounds will lose their scent. Steal away home, you know, isn't just about escaping to, to heaven. It's keeping the hope alive that you can escape to freedom down here now. These are songs of defiant resistance, political activism, not fantasy escapism. Our lives, you know, may be a lot more comfortable than our first century forebears living under the brutality of, of these emperors like Nero, to whom, by the way, the number 666 refers, you know, or, or Domitian. But we nevertheless still live, I think, with puzzling contradictions, 
when horrible illness or loss strikes, when children and teachers are killed and maimed pointlessly, when a wretched despot devastates a neighbouring country, when species are disappearing forever. I mean, these are real dilemmas in which there's something surely deep inside of us that says, why, why, why are these things happening? I completely understand what Revelation is about in its historical setting. You know, I understand that completely. But the cognitive dissonance that I live with today drives me much more in the direction of searching for better theologies than the ones that, that place me in the sort of picture that Revelation would put me into. Better ways to understand God than to reduce divinity to the level of vengefulness and retribution and conquest and warriorship and all that kind of thing. I don't want a God reduced to my level at its worst, you know, a God of petty power and certainty. No, no, I'm reaching for a God of mystery and love. And, and so, to me, cognitive dissonance drives me to search for different theology, for different ways of understanding and picturing and experiencing God than the ones that leave me in that sort of dilemma. So me personally, I can't find no satisfaction in what I deem apocalyptic fantasy land. I'm much more inclined towards uh, a liberation style theology, grounded in the reality of what is, but utterly refusing simply to sit back and wait for some deterministic grand plan to kick in, waiting for the end times to happen. And meanwhile, just kind of poddling along in my own little way. I'm, I'm not happy for that. I think that uh, I, I, I don't believe in any sort of gospel of escapism. I believe in a gospel of engagement with the world in a positive uh, and resistant way. So that's a few more thoughts. We'll carry on next week with perhaps thinking a little bit more uh, of Revelation in the context of our own world. But um, hopefully that's a little bit to go away and think about. And now a prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. We are grateful for our friend and brother Jesus, who never asks us to sit around dreaming of a better world, but calls us still to become that better world in word, thought and deed. We understand that there's always more going on than we can see. Machinations of the rich and powerful, invisible forces of intent, control and manipulation. And yet we also find your goodness everywhere too. Help us to live wise as serpents, harmless as doves, picking our way with open hearts through hard choices and puzzling ambiguities, refusing to reduce reality to simplistic dualisms of good or evil, always resisting the temptation to see others as enemies just because they're not us. Spirit of wisdom and reconciliation, grant us visions of a world in which difference is an asset, not a threat, where certainty gives way to mystery, where hope and never-ending new possibility replace deterministic destiny. Amen. Okay, well, I think we should finally just drink to that, don't you? So if you've got uh, a little something handy, please join me now. And uh, I think I can get the top back on. <laughs> join me now in a toast. And um, I'd invite you to hold your glass up with me. It's a toast. A toast to a better world, to enemies becoming friends. A toast to a kinder, more peaceful world where tragedies like shootings and knifings and violence are diminishing and eliminated. A toast to life instead of death. Friends, to life. Lachaim. Fantastic. Well, that's just about it for today. 
Um, if you like what I'm doing here and you'd like to support us, you can buy us a coffee. You can go to the coffee site. The link is here on the screen. You can also always find it at the top of the posts on the Holy Shed Facebook page. And we are so grateful to, you know, those of you who support us in this way and many other ways too. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to finish actually with a poem uh, with some music. It's, it's a lovely poem called For Love. And it's just, I thought about it in the context of the shootings this week. Um, it's by a woman called Dorothy Ogre, and it's about the <laughs> the bombings in Belgium in 2016 when 35 people were killed, including one of her friends. So um, I hope you'll enjoy that <coughs> or be stirred by it as I am in just a moment. Meanwhile, have a great week. Uh, you know, be kind to the world. Be kind to people around you. Be kind, most of all, to yourselves. And whatever happens, whatever you face this week, stay human. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. I shall stand for love, even with a broken soul, even with a heavy heart. I shall stand for love, for the world is wounded, not just my little piece of land, but our world, everywhere, every day. I shall stand for love, for we need more light, not more death, not more powers, not more bombs. I shall stand for love so that our children may be safe, our friends sheltered, our borders open. I shall stand for love, even with a broken soul even with a heavy heart.